technology and data literacies have to be enveloped with human-centered thinking, critical thinking, entrepreneurship, uh, creativity, innovation for us uh, to to enable our learners to thrive in the long term. And this is what these three competencies are what we call as humanics, uh, as opposed to robotics, because we think humanics is the way forward for our learners to be essentially robot. We need to prepare students and learners to be not only competent with data, but to, uh, to be thoughtful, insightful, and meaningful decision makers, and which is where this whole initiative started for us. So the Data Club is obviously a student organization on campus that's dedicated towards developing data literacy for students on campus, whether that means awareness or exposure to a variety of data science tools and applications in both at all business, computer science, financial technology, biology, any application you can think of, that's what we're aiming to bring to students on campus. And so we do put so to three primary mechanisms. The first being speaker events on campus, whether it be faculty or corporate speakers, data workshops that we hold as part of club meetings, and data challenges that we host beyond club meetings, sort of outside of the classroom and outside of the meetings. Just to, to bring a little bit of light to what type of speaker events that we have for our students and our members, we have the ability to, to bring in data science organizations. Could you research. use the microphone, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just use this one. We might make it a little bit easier. So we have the opportunity to bring in data science organizations and research groups in Boston so that our students can learn more about what opportunities that they might have in pursuing data science uh, careers in what fields that might look like. We have, we're going to be having Insight Data Science come in in mid-October for us to present to our students about the program that they run, which is a seven-week fellowship program, looking to just recruit students into the program and to uh, better place them really in data science positions in a variety of corporations. We are going to be having Wayfair come in, who is a leader in data technologies for marketing. And they're going to be talking to our students about what tools that they use and how uh, they are really pushing the envelope in terms of digital marketing. And we're also going to be having Fidelity come in and talk to us uh, about how they are applying data science in the current and financial industries that they are working within. And so the second type of sort of event that we do are general workshops that we mentioned to bring greater data literacy to students on campus. And we're aiming to kind of bring a level of literacy that's matched to the current literacy on campus. So if students you know, are not comfortable with Excel, that's the kind of workshop we try to bring. But if there are groups of students who are more proficient in things like Excel, but they're not maybe as coding savvy, those are the types of workshops that we try to bring. And so historically, we've had workshops in text mining and R, basics of Python with scikit-learn and Tableau visualizations. This semester, we're planning another workshop uh, in Tableau. We're planning a workshop in ArcGIS Online to give students a bit more exposure to data visualization tools they might uh, both want to have for personal reasons, but also as they're going into co-op searches and career searches to be able to bring them to you guys as employers as better suited and more well-rounded data science candidates. And we're having a machine learning workshop series to kind of dispel a bit of the fogginess around what exactly machine learning is, how do you cast a problem as a machine learning problem, how do you get your data, how do you process your data, and how do you ultimately present and deliver visualizations that make it very clear what your data is showing. And in addition to those workshops, we're also looking to host these data challenges. And that's really where these corporate partnerships and engagements kind of come in. How do students apply the skills that they're learning towards our club? How do they take this literacy that they've gained and then apply it to a real world, real, real world context? How do they both provide value to themselves in applying what they've learned, but also provide values to partners in the Boston community, as we mentioned before? And so what we'll be introducing pretty soon is an analytics challenge that we ran with the city of Boston. But what we also have in the pipeline is we're speaking to the DTX company. Um, you met Adam earlier in this, in this forum to talk about how we can kind of leverage that student expertise into solving problems for them. And we're also working with a consulting company in Washington, D.C. called Handshake Partners that is looking to use visualization to kind of develop a way to visualize influence for Fortune 100 clients that they have. We're essentially looking for corporate partners that have problems that they don't necessarily have the, the resources to solve in-house, but they do want to see kind of how students think, how they apply their skills, and ultimately that they're looking to recruit or to solve problems internally while having student expertise. 
So given all these uh, aspects of the Data Club, the uh, speaker events, the workshops, the data challenges, uh, where are we going with all this? Well, one of our biggest goals of the Data Club right now is to uh, have a greater outreach. Right now, the uh, Data Club is very focused in computer science and the school of business. But like we said, we want to increase data literacy of all disciplines. We want to be able to reach out to all the uh, uh, schools uh, such as biology, political science. We want to get into engineering. We want to make sure that we have school, uh, we have uh, students from all schools, from all walks of data science life. Um, and with this increased uh, outreach, we want to be able to get more students into data challenges. We want to get in touch with more businesses in the Boston community so that we're able to uh, put our best students at to work and see what uh, innovative and really interesting uh, data analytics and data visualization that, that they can bring to the table. And once we have these data challenges, once we've made these connections with uh, companies within the city of Boston, we really want to present our best students. We want to use these workshops to educate students and bring them to a point in which we may be able to have them possibly uh, consult with companies and help them analyze data and really put our best uh, students at Northeastern to work bringing uh, what they have to the table with really unique and innovative ways to like it, uh, data sets. And if you were to collapse this entire presentation into like a single point, we're looking and striving to be an organization that delivers value not just to students on campus, but also to you know, partners in the Boston area, whether it's as a recruiting tool, as a way to outsource problems, or as a way to just get a chance to interface with students, see what they can do, and see what their skill levels are. That's what we're trying to be, a one-stop shop for both partners in the Boston area and also students to get a chance to engage with each other and show each other what they so with that, this is our contact information. So if you are a student in the room and really want to get more engaged with us, we are on campus. We do hold bi-weekly meetings. And so you can check us out either by emailing us or just following us on Facebook and connecting us with us on there. We post all of our events there so the students can get more engaged with us and start to really uh, dive deeper into data science. And for companies in the room that want to engage with us, whether it's for recruiting, networking, or you know, setting up a data challenge or a workshop, um, this is our email. Feel free to reach out on any of us to any of us on LinkedIn or to send an email to the club. Uh, and with that, we mentioned earlier that we've been running a data challenge with the city of Boston. To here to kind of talk about that is uh, Professor Hansen. Yeah. All right. So when I was on the panel earlier, I already spoke a little bit about what we're up to at the city of Boston um, as far as data and analytics go, but I thought I would take a few minutes to describe what the team does, um, kind of what our, our purview is, what our scope is within the city, and then I'll get straight to announcing the winners of the challenge. Um, so uh, the city of Boston has something like 17,000 employees uh, working, working for the city, and we at the centralized citywide analytics team uh, are considered a very strong 20 people or so. And our goal is to serve as the data hub for the city of Boston. So we want to uh, be in the privileged position of having any data needs passed through us in some way uh, so that we can, can serve as a facilitator for departments. Now there are some limitations to that. Many of the departments in the city, uh, by virtue of security reasons or privacy concerns, will have their own in-house team. I'm thinking of the police department or uh, public schools, for example. Uh, but those people that are housed in City Hall, we're hoping that we can really help them do better in government by providing this data hub. Uh, so there, there are a couple of, of components to that. Uh, on the team, we have uh, data analysts, we have data engineers, uh, and we have a, a data science program, uh, which I'm running. Um, and the data analysts tend to work on projects with stakeholders within the city, trying to improve operations. There's a lot of work building dashboards and, and, and helping people meet the key metrics they need to make, meet for the city of Boston. The data engineers are the ones that are putting together this centralized platform uh, and building pipelines that automate processes for the city. And then as a data scientist, I have this great opportunity to try to sink my teeth into some deeper projects, perhaps with a little bit of a predictive modeling component to it. Um, and with that in mind, I thought uh, just in the interest of illustrating some interesting work that we're doing, I'd talk for just a couple seconds about a project that I'm really excited about that's ongoing uh, to be determined what the output will be. Uh, but I, I'm working on a project with the Department of Neighborhood Development, which is essentially Boston's housing department, uh, on trying to reform homeless shelters in Boston. And the, the challenge is that when an individual enters 
the, the homeless shelter system, even if you've worked in that sector for your entire life, it can be really, really difficult to understand if that's the kind of person that just needs a place to stay for a night or two and is going to be able to get back on their feet, or if there's somebody who is at risk of being product of homeless unless they get some kind of targeted intervention, some assistance. Uh, and because that's such a thorny, challenging problem, the hope is that the massive amount of data that we have that supports this system might be able to shed some light on who good candidates are for that kind of targeted assistance. Um, and of course, part of what makes this project really interesting are all of the deep ethical considerations that come up when you start working with very personal data like this. Uh, so that, that's a, you know, maybe not a typical project for what we do at the city, but it's certainly one that I'm really excited about. Um, and if that sounds like for the students that are in the room something that might be interesting to you, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to get involved in the city. Uh, we definitely work with students while you're in school on, on projects, uh, if we can find an appropriate match. But we also have a summer fellows program that I will shamelessly advertise right now. Uh, keep an eye out for it. The applications tend to open around January. Uh, and we on the analytics team house some summer fellows each year. There are also a number of other departments that have more data-oriented analytic fellowships. Uh, and I can't recommend them highly enough. Often the fellows will go on to work at the city uh, after they finish school. Um, and there were some really successful projects that the students executed just this past summer. Okay, so with that, I'm, I'm going to end my part of it. You guys are here to hear about the, the awards that we just gave. So uh, the, the city has partnered with uh, the, the data club here for this challenge to try to tackle the question of how to make bike safety better in the city of Boston. Uh, and so a number of the the student groups here have tackled it in distinct ways, trying to visualize and make some recommendations for the city on how we can improve bike safety. And so uh, I hope that you had a chance to look at some of the posters. I really enjoyed adjudicating this challenge, and, and I guess I will uh, turn it over to each of these students. They're going to give a presentation on the work that they've done, uh, and then we'll give the awards. So we're going to be starting out with the team that labeled themselves Carfox. Yeah. So I asked him to use the approach to the problem with an engineering mindset. Um, we began by brainstorming, um, or we began by redefining better biking in Boston. Um, it was to fix places with the most potential for crash reduction first. Those practical limitations um, will ensure that some locations are fixed before others, um, and we want those locations to be ones that can reduce the most crashes overall. Um, so for background, we searched for an extensive data set on Boston bike crashes. Um, Vision Zero had us covered, having collected that data since 2015. Um, using Excel, we totaled the bike crashes at each location and mapped it in Tableau. So while this graph is indicative of the most frequent crash sites in Boston, it does not alone solve our problem. We want locations whose solutions could diminish the most crashes. So to fix those locations, we had to brainstorm how to find those locations. Our solution was to come up with a quantitative analysis or a statistic, which we defined as the bike crashes above the average location of the same bike traffic volume. Uh, we call the statistic crashes above average, or CAE. So the premise of CAE is that it's the difference between the actual and expected uh, crashes at a location. Uh, crashes, expected crashes at a location uh, is a pure function of the bike traffic through that location. Okay, so great, we have a statistic. Um, in order to actually find the CAE though, we need um, traffic count data. So um, Boston actually in 2017, they conducted a traffic count study, but it was only for two random days and only for 62 locations. So we paired that up with the um, crash sites that were given by Vision Zero, and we came up with this potential for crash reduction graph. And so with the CAE, what we're doing is we're assuming that the number of car crashes or the number of bike crashes that occur at a location is correlated or it's, um, it's proportional to the number of bikes that flow through that location. And so here, though, we can see the difference between the actual number of um, bike crashes and the expected number of crashes by the size and the color of each point. And so in summary, we can find the locations with the highest potential crash reduction by um, 
finding the locations and calculating the CAE for those locations. But we only had 62 points because that was those were the only um, data sets available from Boston, so we should expand on that. And so what we're trying to find out is if this is financially possible, and based on our research, it should be, because the traffic group actually released um, the cost of uh, work for studying traffic in the US, and we compared that with the public budgets that Boston provides, and a traffic study um, a traffic count study would only be like a small portion of the um, of the budget that's provided to the Office of Streets and the Department of Public Works. And even a, uh, a high-end study, one that costs two standard deviations above the mean price for a traffic count study, that would also be possible for Boston as well. So our proposal is that we complete, we get a more complete data set for um, Boston's traffic count studies and we pinpoint the locations with the highest crashes above average and we conduct a comprehensive study based on that. And that will provide us better biking in Boston. Thank you very much. Visualizing Boston bike incidents. So we are all aware that the biking as a mode of transport is fast and affordable, healthy, and most of all, fun. However, the current banking network poses many problems. So our, the first step of our type of visualization was to show the severity of these problems to our users. So why should we care about the Boston current banking network? Well, we found that there are 30, there are 38,000 updates batteries daily, and this has led to 1,700 emergency responses to bad meters annually. And this even caused to 13 fatalities between 2010 and 2015. So we want to involve our users to the visualization. So we try to provide many interactive features. And these features would allow the user, whether it be a data analyst, a policy maker, or even the cyclist themselves, to get to import, to get a chance to explore the data and also develop the policies which can contribute to improving the current bike situation. So here we have the high level view of the bike incidents from previous four years. We use the page feature in the Tableau to allow the user to toggle between years as shown in the animation. Yeah, as you can see, you can see the total number of incidents, the locations, as well as the types for each year. And next up, we provide the users with an interacting, interactive map highlighting all incidents. On the right, the user can filter for whether the incident occurred on the bike network or not. We feel this feature is necessary as it highlights roads that could potentially be included in the bike network, as well as existing roads that could be further looked into. To gain more insight, the user can also filter by street. Here we see the user clicking onto Commonwealth Ave, and all the incidents associated with the street appear on the map, as well as the time series view of the data. We also see a heat map which associates the day, day and time the incident occurred. Additional to this, the user can click on individual pins on the map to also filter by street. We feel the functionality provided in this detailed section is very easy to use, providing freedom for the user to understand, interact, and explore the data. So here is the final output. In the bottom section, we provide a take home message for cyclists and, and how they can enjoy Boston roads. We made sure to cite all our data sources through an external link to ensure that this visualization has data integrity. We believe our visualization tells a story that motivates individuals to take the current situation seriously and develop policies to enable safer roads for cyclists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nagita Valru, and I'm a fourth year computer science and finance major. So, so uh, the visualization challenge posed one main question, which is how can we make biking safer and more enjoyable than possible? I thought of including weather and location data to find patterns of bike incidents based on the weather. I constructed the weather data using a radiograph where we have temperature, which is daily low and high temperature, wind speed, so daily average wind speed, and fastest two minute gust speed, and precipitation, so daily rainfall and snowfall. We can additionally filter this data through year or years and specific months. On the other side, I overlaid bicycle incident data from the Boston Police Department's crime report data set on onto a map of Boston. Um, and I can additionally filter through years and months while also filtering through whether the incident is part of the Boston's bike network or not. Putting the two together, we get a scalable dashboard that allows us to find correlations between weather and location of incidents throughout the city. Some interesting observations that I found were that during the windy seasons, which are the months of October slash November and February to March, there are a cluster of accidents around Chinatown and Back Bay, which might infer that there are wind tunnels there. Um, but how does this help Boston to find how we can make the city safer for cyclists? My prediction is to use this information and wrap this around a Waze style app where cyclists can find real-time data using the patterns of weather and the current incident reports. In addition, we can also allow for real-time data, so live weather reports or user feedback. So for example, hey, there's an accident here, avoid this route. Um, that's all I have. I had a lot of fun with this com uh, competition, and I look forward to it. Thank you. All right, thank you. And we're going to welcome our last group, Cyclo Analysts. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Justin Miller, and I'm the sole member of the Cycloanalysts. Well, I'm just a freshman here at Northeastern, I think I make up for my lack of analytical experience with my biking experience. I'm an avid mountain biker, and if there's one thing I've learned from the hours of scrapes and bruises is that awareness is everything when it comes to safety. But still, in Boston, since 2015, we have seen 1,982 bicycle incidents that have been reported to the city. Vision Zero has collected this data and described whether it happened at a street or an intersection. Now, I don't know about you, but 400 serious accidents every year seems like a problem. But how do we even begin to analyze a data set that is this irregular and complex? Well, we break it up a little bit. Interestingly enough, intersections make up for more than half of all incidents. And just 162 of these already accounts for a quarter of the city's problems. Because of the congregated nature of this data, any improvement in intersections would have a significant improvement on the city as a whole. Yet, they don't receive the attention they deserve. We continue to invest in infrastructure that is primarily designed to improve street conditions, such as regular bike lanes and protected bike lanes. And while they are great when you're traveling alongside traffic, they can't keep intersections safe. This is because drivers are often distracted, and cyclists can't really turn around without sacrificing their balance, which creates a dangerous situation in itself. So I'm proposing a two-tiered plan to improve the awareness of everybody at these intersection incident hotspots. The first would directly improve the awareness of cyclists. We would do this by installing four convex mirrors at these pre-mentioned intersections. This would allow cyclists to check their blind spots, and I'd estimate that it would only cost around 350 grand for the city to do. 
We should also consider offering all citizens bicycle reflectors to increase visibility at night. This is because more than 13% of incidents happen between sunset and sunrise, and we should provide safety equipment to everybody, even those who can't afford it. We could also indirectly improve the condition of cyclists by improving driver's awareness. To do this, we can install some combination of signs and markers and warnings at intersections that let people know when to have caution. So what kind of results could we expect from this project? Well, since mirrors are present at a quarter of all intersections, even if only a handful of cyclists actually use them, we could still see a 5 to 10% improvement in the overall incidents. These signs and markers would have a more extended effect because they would likely cause drivers to remain a cautious state for a minute or two after the intersection. And since just 13 streets make up more than half of all incidents, this could have a lasting effect. Overall, this entire proposal is based on the assumption that bike lanes do not protect intersections as well as they do streets. And we can support this. Looking at our two worst intersections, looking at our two worst overall streets, we see that they have a very high ratio of intersections to street incidents. This is a common theme among the top 13%, which again, make up half of all incidents. Yet these are all completely or almost completely filled with bike lanes already. And in fact, if we do a binomial test for significance between the ratio of the top 13 and the rest of the bike lanes, we find that there is a significant difference in the ratio of intersection incidents and street incidents. So while we can't necessarily say that anything is causing anything in this relationship, we do know that we need to think of a new method, an outside of the box method, to apply for all facets of incidents in our city. The city should also work to make this enjoyable because biking is meant to be a fun, clean way of commuting or just exercising. And to raise money, we could host fundraisers, citywide events, and road races to promote the city and the project. Yeah, so thank you for your time. And there's more information. <laughs> to all the presenters and obviously all the participants for uh, participating in the competition. Uh, with that, I'll let Matt take it away with the uh, board. a pleasure to, to judge this competition because I thought that there was quite a breadth of, uh, of both technical competence and also creativity uh, among all of the, the teams. Uh, first, I'll recognize the poster finalist, uh, Krish Sharma. I'm not sure if I think he couldn't make it, he couldn't make it here, so move on to, to the, the presentations then. OK, uh, that's right. So staying with the, the poster component of it, we have finally the, the People's Choice Award. Uh, so this was voted upon by all the, the folks who came here to the forum uh, using the tickets that they got at the beginning. And the winner of the People's Choice is NU Exchange. So now, uh, addressing all of our finalists, uh, the, I, the first award I'm going to give is an honorable mention to uh, exceptional creative visual design. And I thought that this project showed a lot, stood out a lot in the choices that they made with visual uh, and approached it in a different way than the other groups did. So that goes to Mahita Baluru. Sure, that would be number two. Uh, okay, uh, now we're going to go in descending order. Uh, awesome. uh, starting with third place. Uh, third place goes to a group that I thought showed uh, an exceptional ability to research the background behind the challenge. 
Uh, I thought that this team did a great job of injecting uh, context into the question and trying to be very targeted in, in the approach to the solution. Uh, at the city, we're, we're not, of course, interested just in having a pleasing visual. We also really want the, the, one of the teams to sink into the policy component of it. And I thought this team did a very good job of that. So third place goes to Car Fox, Benjamin Fox, and Kerry Town. Second place, I thought was exceptional because this team uh, set about attacking this problem in a very targeted way and came up with a suggestion that was really concrete and applicable uh, and stood out tremendously for that. So second place goes to Justin Miller. Which leads first place, also the People's Choice winner, uh, goes to NU Exchange. I thought that this team. Uh, I just wanted to say that I thought this team had an absolutely exceptional user design in their, in their, both in the poster, but especially in the dashboard that they built. Uh, professional quality to the point where I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing it with the stakeholders at the City of Boston that would be useful. I also wanted to say that we would like to extend an invitation to the winners of this challenge to come visit us for an afternoon at the City of Boston. If you're interested, to shout out some of the data analysts that we have and, and see, see if that's an area that might be interested in working. Um, and with that, I would like to thank all the finalists, for all of you for, for coming and participating in this. We're really happy at the City of Boston to have the opportunity to, to meet a lot of these students that have creative solutions to this. Also really like to thank the Data Club for partnering with the city, and I hope that we can do it again soon. Uh, and the, the Data Initiative as well for, for helping us uh, tackle this problem a bit. So thank you to all of you. So I hope you really enjoyed that. I did, and when we um, envisaged doing a challenge with the Student Driver Club, and um, Matt Smith was kind enough to offer his insights and his judging expertise, we had no idea that um, students were very uh, motivated not to get hit by cars either, because they really cycle a lot, and you and Matt cycle yourself. I am, yes. And so I think one of the secrets, so we want to work, not just the Dari Bar, the Dari Initiative, we want to work with companies a lot. Um, calendars are a great format. So we love hackathons. Um, some of you are really good at hackathons. We do find that format is best for heavy coding or heavy statistical style challenges, right? So if you have that kind of challenge as a company or as an organization, we're happy to, to entertain that hackathon environment because that's just pizza and caffeine, right? We, we can do that. Um, that got livers and kidneys, and that's, that's a huge problem. So for smaller problems, or problems of a, of a creative kind, we are proposing the challenge format, right, as, as a way to have, a say, one week, two week, three week period, where we post a challenge, and this is all done virtually. Like, I think nobody met anybody physically until today, right? And it's a very efficient format, and it works very well, because we publicize it across every college, every group at Northeastern. Uh, the people that we present today, across all colleges, right? And it's a very efficient way to do it. It also showcases our, our talent to you directly. It gets the faculty out of the way. Right. Sometimes we're part of the solution, sometimes we're part of the problem. And to get the students to you directly in this format is completely unfiltered. Right. Um, no, Matt was on the judge, so I didn't do any of the um, assessment there, and I think it's a great, great, friendly format.